Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. I was muted till now. I didn't even realize. And you gave us half the lesson, right? Um, well, you'll hear it again now. So um, we're going to learn about uh, Avram's hospitality and his outreach, which we read about in this week's Pasha today. Okay, so the Torah says, Vayita Eshel Bev'er Sheva, which means that Avraham planted an Eshel, which is a type of tree, in Be'er Sheva. Vayikrasham B'Shem Hashem Kel Olam. And he called out there in the name of Hashem, the God of the world, or the everlasting God. Uh, the word Eshel is translated in different ways, according to different commentaries. Some say it was literally a tree and that the guests would sit under a tree. Some say that it was a orchard and he would feed his guests from those trees. And some say it was an inn because the word Eshel can be an acronym for Achila, Shasia, and Lina, eating, drinking, and spending the night. So he made an inn for wayfarers, for travelers, and um, he used that inn both as a method of doing kindness so that people who were traveling had a place to eat and sleep and so on, and also as an opportunity to spread the belief in monotheism which was really Avraham's um, raison d'etre, as they say. That was really his life's uh, focus, spreading the word of the one Hashem to the world. So here's the Gemara in Sota that explains what he would do. The Gemara says, and he planted a nation on Be'er called called in the name of Hashem, the everlasting God. Reish Lakish says, this teaches us that Avraham made an orchard and planted in it all kinds of sweet things. The verse states, and he planted an Eshel on Be'er Sheva, and he called there, the word for calling in Hebrew is Vayikra, in the name of Kel Olam, the everlasting God. Rishlakish said, do not read the word Vayikra, but rather Vayakri. Vayikra means he called, Vayakri means he made others call. How did he make others call? So the Gemara says, this teaches that Avraham, our forefather, caused the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, to be called out in the mouths of all the passers-by. How so? After the guests of Avraham ate and drank, they arose to bless him. He said to them, but did you eat from what is mine? Rather, you ate from the food of the God of the world. Therefore, you should thank and praise and bless the one who spoke and the world was created. In this way, Avram caused everyone to call out to God. So, very often, we thank the waiter who brought us the food. But sometimes we forget to thank the chef who made the food and perhaps the delivery guy who brought the food to the kitchen and the farmer, even more so, who produced the field, or the um, butcher, or what have you, who produced the field, uh, the, the food, uh, you know, on its way to the store, or to the restaurant, or what have you. So, of course, they thanked Avraham for providing the wonderful meal that he provided on the way, where there was nothing else around, and so on, a tremendous kindness. But he reminded them that this was not done in a vacuum, that Hashem is really the one that made all of this possible. The trees, the fruit, whatever else he was serving them ultimately came from Hashem. And he brought that to their attention so that they could thank Hashem. Now, of course, in those days, it wasn't so simple for people to thank Hashem because people believed in all kinds of other gods as well. So why would they thank 
Avram's God if they could think whatever other God they believed in, the God of the sun, the wind, the rain, the earth, the tree, who knows? So here's the Medrash. The Medrash picks up where the Gemara left off, and it says, if the person accepted it and blessed, right, thank Hashem, then she would eat and drink and go. If not, meaning to say if the person resisted and said, no, I don't believe in that, and I'm not going to do it, Avram would say, okay, give me what you have, meaning to say you have to pay for your meal. If they benched, right, if they, if they said, thank you, Tashem, they did not have to pay. But if they did not, he would make them pay. The person would say, what do you have that I owe you? Like, how much? How much is it, basically? And he would answer, one measure of wine for 10 coins, one cut of meat for 10 coins, one loaf of bread for 10 coins. Now, it seems that these coins were expensive. Of course, we don't know exactly what those currencies were compared to our day's currency. But it seems that this was very expensive. And the people would protest. And they would say, why is he charging so much? And Avram would answer, who gave you wine in the wilderness? Who gave you meat in the middle of the wilderness? Who gave you bread in the, in the wilderness? Basically, I'm providing a service that is actually very costly to give you all of these things in the middle of nowhere. And that's why I have the right to charge this high price. And the people realized that they really had no choice but to pay. Once the person understood the predicament that Avram set up, then the person would say, Baruch Kel El Blessed is the God on high from whom we ate. And this is why it is tzedakah's written in the beginning and justice at the end. So in the Pasuk about Avram that we read about in the Parsha, it says, Lasa is tzedakah u mishpat, that, Hash, that Avram did tzedakah and mishpat. So the, Gemar, the, the Medrash is explaining the term here, tzedakah and mishpat. He did tzedakah if the people would say, thank you to Hashem, then he would give them tzedakah, which was the meal. But if they were not so quick to thank Hashem, then he would do mishpat. He was tough with them. He would do justice, and he would force them to either pay or thank Hashem, which it seems they would inevitably do. So this is a pretty famous medrash about Avram Avinu. Now the question is, Question of the asks. Question, yes? Yeah, I, I didn't understand it. Vayakri, Vayakri means read, I read for you. Vayakri means to make others call. Vayikra is to call. Vayakri is to make others call. Not that I know of. Okay. Yeah, please, when, you, when you're reading a book for somebody else. When you are reading a book for somebody else. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Not sure. Can't say that. Could I'm be both, maybe. Grammar. It could be both. Could be both. I'm not really sure. Okay, so the question is, what exactly was Avraham trying to accomplish by forcing these people to say thank you to Hashem? Obviously, if Avraham did it, there was something deep. This wasn't just, you know, a game that he was playing to try to get his way. If he did it, he was trying to accomplish something. He felt that there was something meaningful for <laughs> people to say thank you, even though they kind of were doing it under duress. So the question is, what exactly was he trying to accomplish? Why is that an accomplishment? To force somebody to thank Hashem. 
and 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 then they say thank you. They don't really mean it. They just want to get out of paying. So why is that considered an accomplishment? Really? Yes, please. I would assume it's a form of musr in some ways, isn't it? I, I, I'm not saying. I mean, um, you know, in putting them under din if they don't, you know, show respect to Hashem. Okay, I hear you. Who is speaking? I can't tell who's speaking. Moshe. Speaking? Moshe. Moshe. Okay. Because your screen is not on, that's why I couldn't see. Okay, so, um, I mean, it definitely is kind of Musser. You know, he's basically giving giving them a zetz, hitting them over the head with a bill. So he is for sure giving them Musser. But the question is, is it really being effective? Like, are they actually going to believe anything? Or are they just going to get him off their heads? Yes. Well, we know if if you do it a few times and they like it, they might follow it. But Ooh. even if you do it one time, at least you introduce them to the concept of, of uh, his God. And, and maybe they like it, you know, to say a blessing. Okay, so you're saying it, it's something that will grow on them. Maybe yeah. they don't really believe it the first time, but maybe the second time, maybe the third time. Maybe saying it will help it sink in. Right. I hear you. I hear you. Yisrael, well, your hand is raised. Yes. yes I, have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, did all wayfarers who passed by uh, get Abraham's attention? Or was he selective? I mean, I would think that there are some people who might pose a physical risk to him. Um, that's an interesting question. Did he uh, pick and choose his guests? I mean, in general, Avraham was non-discriminatory. He had a non-discrimination policy didn't depend on the race or the religion or the skin color or the gender. I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> well, but in terms of being afraid of these people, I mean, Avram and his servant Eliezer, I mean, they went after four kings, wiped them out. I mean, no problem. They had things under control. So, you know, I'm not saying he started up with people randomly, but generally the people that would come to him were people that uh, that he that he would uh, feel comfortable to serve. I imagine. Yes, Moshe. Um, in Mamre, he also, when he was circumcised, he uh, accepted uh, people. He was very hospitable to them as well. You know, from yes. what I remember. Now, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu also. When once the um, uh, you know the, they they left to Mitzrayim, you know uh, they didn't have a choice but to follow along, and they couldn't go back probably at that point once they went the, they reached the point of no return, you know because otherwise they would have been killed, you know. So I mean, they're basically this seems to be that they're you know they're they're not it, it, in other words they're showing mercy Rachmanut. But yet, <laughs> then as well, you know, the showing that in order to to get Rachmanut, you don't have a choice either way. But you'll you'll if you don't, you're you're under din. You know, that's the way it, that it, that's the way it looks. You know. And okay. there's, uh, I hear you. It's going to be uh, we're going to come to something similar in our explanation. <laughs> Very good. So, in order to understand this, Rabbi, yes, I was going to say that um, it, it's reminding me a little bit of the Ahafta, uh, the first paragraph of Shema. So the question is asked, how can you make a commandment that you should love Hashem? And the answer that's given is that we introduce it into our mind. It's similar to what Ben said. We introduce the idea into our mind and we start to think about it. So when, I, when Avram says to people about Hashem and blessing and he's the source of the food, whether they agree to it or not, they start to think about it. And it introduces that into their uh, lexicon. 
Right. There is definitely such a concept in psychology that uh, saying something will, you know, leads to some kind of change in your belief. Just saying it, even if you don't believe it at first, you can say it, think about it again, you know, mull it over, and eventually it might uh, might sink in. So yes, there's something to that. Okay, so here's the Rambam in the laws of divorce and of the second chapter. When a man whom the law requires to be compelled to divorce his wife does not desire to divorce her. Okay, so let's say, you know, the way Jewish divorce works is different than the way it works in the secular society. And secular society, I don't know how it works in other states, but uh, in, in the state of Florida, either party can sue for divorce, and even if the other party does not want, the court can issue uh, the divorce. In the Jewish law, the way it works is that the husband must be the one who gives the divorce to his wife. His wife has to receive it, that's true, but he's the one who must give it. So it's similar to the ring of the Kiddushin. When a couple gets married, the husband has to give, or the future husband has to give the future wife a ring or another object of value. He gives it, she receives it, and with this, they are betrothed. Similarly, to get divorced, he gives, she receives, and with this, they are married. Uh, excuse me, they are divorced. That is the physical get, the paper that has the, uh, the words about divorce on it and so on. Now, obviously, if both parties are happy to give the get or receive the get, then it's no problem. But what if he is refusing to give it? And it's, it's a situation where, by law, she has the right to demand it based on his bad behavior or what have you. So the Rambam says the court should have him beaten until he consents, at which time they should have a get written. The get is acceptable. This applies at all times and in all places. So they would actually use physical corporal punishment. They would beat the fellow until he would agree to give the get. Uh, they still do this in some bate din, and you can get into big trouble in America where it's uh, illegal to beat people, <laughs> even to force them to give a get. There was a rabbi who was guilty of being part of such a base din, and I believe he spent time in jail, actually. So he says this applies at all times and in all places. This is theoretically possible even today. Now, in the state of Israel, the base din does have rights over matters of marriage and divorce. They do not have the right to beat people, but they do have the right to incarcerate people. The rabbinate of the state of Israel will put get refusers into jail until they agree to give the get. They can even put them into solitary confinement and so on. So that's all based on this idea. Similarly, the Rambam continues, if Gentiles beat him while telling him, do what the Jews are telling you to do. So basically the court hires some goons and the goons do the beating and tell him to give the get as per the instruction of the Jewish court. And the Jews have the Gentiles apply pressure on him until he consents to divorce his wife. The divorce is acceptable. If, however, the Gentiles compel him to write a get on their own initiative, the get is merely unacceptable. The rationale is that the law requires him to give a divorce. Okay, so if the Gentiles coerce him, but they are not coercing him based on the based in ruling, then the get is not valid. And that is a problem in some situations. There are some states where they have a get law, where a couple is compelled to give a get, a religious get, if there is a civil divorce. And then there's a penalty if they don't give it. I believe they passed that law in New York State. I don't know if it's still current or if the courts threw it out. I'm not sure. But there was a get law passed in New York State. And that was to prevent women who were agunas, whose, whose husbands were get refusers, 
uh, to force them to give a get. The problem with that law is that if the if the secular state is forcing people to give a get in a case where the halacha mandates that they give it, that is an acceptable get. But if they're forcing him to give a get when the halacha does not mandate it, then it's called a coerced get, which is mean it's actually not a valid get. So they're trying to fix things, and, and perhaps it's not fixing it, perhaps it's actually making it worse. But in any case, the Rambam continues, and here is the point that we're getting to. Why is the get not void? For his being compelled, either by Jews or by Gentiles, to divorce against his will. And a get must be given voluntarily. The whole point of the get is that the husband is giving it. How is he giving it if he's being forced to give it? So the Rambam explains, and this is a very important concept, because the concept of being compelled against one's will applies only when speaking about a person who is being compelled and forced to do something that the Torah does not obligate him to do. For example, a person who is beaten until he consented to a sale or to give a present. So in that case, the Torah does not mandate him to give a sale or a present, and the fact that he's being forced means that that sale or that present is invalid because he doesn't really want it. If, however, a person's evil inclination presses him to negate the observance of a mitzvah or to commit a transgression, that's a sin, and he was bitten, beaten until he performed the action he was obligated to, for, to perform, or he disassociated himself from the forbidden action, he is not considered to have been forced against his will. On the contrary, it is he himself who is forcing his own conduct to become debased. So here is the vort, as they say in Yiddish. Here is the concept. Rabbi, here, yes. are you able to, uh, there's a lot of background noise on and off. So can you mute some people? Or, and people can unmute themselves when they speak. I will mute everybody and feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question, yes. Okay. So here's the concept once again. When a person does something that is against the Torah, they are going against their inner will. Every Jew's inner will is to do the right thing. That's what their soul wants them to do. Every Jew deep down wants to serve Hashem, wants to do mitzvahs, does not want to go against the will of Hashem, wants to be kind, wants to be nice, never to hurt anybody else, to say all the brachas, to keep all the mitzvahs, and so on. Sometimes we get distracted by our own yetzer haraz, which is our own evil inclinations, and these force us, so to speak, externally to have other desires. But that's not really what we want. Right? Let's say a person is eating. They're overeating. They're eating a food that is not good for them. Their doctor told them, you're not allowed. They're smoking. It's killing them. My father remembers his, his grandfather, who should rest in peace. My father should have a long life. So my father's grandfather, he, he smoked, and he had, uh, he had to have his limbs amputated because of the uh, bad circulation in his extremities due to his smoking. So he couldn't really walk. And he was living at my grandparents' house, his daughter, that is my grandmother. And uh, my father remembers him towards the end of his life when he didn't recognize my father anymore. And he would say to him, Yingala, bring me a shvebala. Young boy, bring me a match because he wanted to smoke, even though smoking was literally killing him. But he, he, he just wanted to. So that kind of desire, it's not an inner desire. That's a very superficial desire. That's the desire for immediate gratification, just to feel good at the moment, 
But deep down, nobody wants that kind of stuff. They're just not able to control themselves, perhaps, in the moment. But their inner desire is, of course, to be healthy and, and to live longer. They're being forced, so to speak, by their um, whims. So back to the fellow with a get. With regard to this person who outwardly refuses to divorce his wife, he wants to be part of the Jewish people. And he wants to perform all the mitzvahs and eschew all the transgressions. That's a good word. It is only his evil inclination that presses him. Therefore, when he is beaten until his evil inclination has been weakened and he consents to the divorce, he is considered to have performed the divorce willfully. Different laws apply when the law does not require him to divorce his wife and a Jewish court of simple people compel him to divorce. So this guy is considered unacceptable. Okay, we're not going to finish all the Rambam, but, but the point is if he's compelled to give it in a, in a situation where the Torah does not mandate it, then it's not a valid get because it's not necessarily his inner will to give it since it's not something the Torah commands him to do. But if, if it is a situation in which, according to the Torah, he must give that get, and he is being compelled to do so, well, even though he says he doesn't want to, or at least before they started beating him, he said he doesn't want to, but when he says that he does want to after the beating, he is not just saying it superficially, he's also saying it from very deep. Because very deeply, he does want to do the right thing. In between, there's a layer of himself that, that wants to be hurtful and, and hurt his wife or his soon-to-be ex-wife and just make her trouble. But deep down, he really does want to do the right thing. And therefore, when he says, when he says it, plus he deep down wants to do it, that is considered to be his will. So far, so good. So, coming back to this situation of Avraham and his guests, that we know that there are no atheists in a foxhole. And that is simply a matter of fact. Um, I've never been in a foxhole, but I did speak to somebody who was in a foxhole. I don't know if I told you this yet. Did I share this yet in this class? So I used to go on Friday afternoons to put tefillin on Jewish people in Middle Neck Road in Great Neck. And there was an elderly fellow, he was in his 90s, who uh, he, he would never put on tefillin. Unfortunately, till the day he passed away, I never prevailed upon him to put on tefillin. He was from Wyoming. And he was willing to give up his life at a very young age for the sake of Hashem. He told me when he was like eight years old, uh, his quote-unquote friends from the nearby farms tied him to a tree and they put wood around him and they said they're going to burn him at the stake, just like in the Inquisition, if he didn't accept Christianity. They were like reenacting the... Uh, you know, those those burning at the stakes. And uh, and he refused. And they lit the fire and they ran away. And he started crying and screaming. And meanwhile, an adult passed by and, and saved him and, and so on. So anyway, but he, he didn't grow up religious. He just grew up knowing, knowing that he was Jewish. He was a World War I veteran. And he told me he was in those foxholes in World War I, and he said, if the bombs hit directly on top of the foxhole, everybody in it was, was finished. So they could hear the bombs, the whistle of the bombs in the air, and he said, in that foxhole, he can say from experience, there were no atheists. Everybody was praying. The Jews, the Christians, people who said they believed, they didn't believe, everybody was praying because there was nothing they could do other than pray. So when the people pray in the foxhole, 
what does it mean? Are they just doing it because they they really may as well just give it a shot? Or is it something deeper than that? Is it that deep, deep down, on a very deep level, they actually believe in a higher power? They believe in a higher power that can save them and that can change things and that cares about them and listens to their prayers. But when they're going about their daily lives, they're kind of not paying attention to, to that belief. Because if you believe in that, then maybe you have to, you know, keep certain laws and eat certain foods and do certain things, whatever religion it is, you know. And they don't want to do that. So they kind of push that, uh, that feeling and that belief to the side. But under pressure, what's coming out is the truth that on a very deep level, they do believe. And we see this from a verse in Bamidbar, in Numbers, with the story of the spies. So what happened? The Jewish people wanted to send spies to spy out the land of Israel. And we know, everybody knows, 12 spies went, two spies came back with a good report, 10 spies came back with a bad report. And they said, uh, we're never going to make it. We're going to be killed. We may as well go back to Egypt. Why are we here? Are there not enough graves in Egypt that Moshe had to take us to the desert to die or to, to Israel to be killed? What's the point? Anyway, Hashem got angry, so to speak. Hashem doesn't really get angry, but Hashem showed us his anger. Let's put it, put it that way. And Hashem said, okay, you don't want to go into the land. That's fine. You're not going to go into the land. You're all going to die here in the desert, and your children will go into the land. So you would think the people would say, hey, that's great. <laughs> we didn't want to go in, and we didn't want to die. So thank you very much for not making us go. Now we'll die at peace in the, in the desert. We'll live till the ripe old age of 60 right? Because they were only supposed to be in the desert for 40 years, corresponding to the number of days the spies were in the land. So those that were 20 would live till 60. Those that were 21 would live till 60. Whatever, however many years you had left till 60, at least they would live till 60 and not have to go and get destroyed, at least the way they believed, by, by fighting in Canaan. But no, the Jews didn't say that. The verse says in chapter 14, verse 40, they arose early in the morning and ascended to the mountaintop, saying, we are ready to go up to the place of which Hashem has spoken, for we have sinned. So as soon as Hashem got mad at them and said, you guys are not going into the land, as soon as that happened, they, they said, hey, wait, 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 no, 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 second, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. We believe. We're going to go. We're ready to go. We're ready to fight. Of course, at that point, it was too late. Hashem said, don't go. They went anyway, and, and they were wiped out. Not all of them, but the ones that went up were wiped out. So here again, we see these were people who just a few hours earlier had been complaining and kvetching that they don't want to go. But when Hashem got mad at them, and they experienced a little bit of a, a tracel, as they say in Yiddish. They, they got shaken up. So their inner belief in Hashem and in Hashem's power really came out. Okay, I've been talking for some time, so we need some input here from the uh, students. Rabbi. Yes. And they say in Yiddish, <laughs> Hashem said, that's time to us off a dish, you know. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> exactly. But I shouldn't, I'm sorry, it's not appropriate to say that, but I just said, you know, it's, uh, he, he gave them an option, you know, uh, either you do or you don't do, you know. <laughs> yep. That's correct. Once he, uh, once he came out strong against them, they, uh, they backed down right away. What about people who agreed to praise but different gods? So that was not at all an option for Avraham. Avraham's whole purpose was to get them to believe in one God. Now, of course, if they tried to pray to other God, 
other gods and praise other gods, Avraham would give them a lesson in monotheism and explain to them how the other gods have no power and Hashem is the only powerful one. And I'm sure he gave it over in a very clear manner until he convinced them. But if he didn't convince them, they would have to pay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. That because he what? did, it was an option. It was an option of learning uh, the, you know, the valid point of praising just the God that he believes is one and only. Exactly. Okay. Because exactly. I was not sure about it. I thought that it was either or. And, you right. know, it no, was no, kind of they, had to, they had to believe and thank the one God. Let me just close this window that's making so much noise. Um, they had to believe in the, in the one and only God. Um, although, you know, it's better to believe in something than in nothing. You know, at least a pagan has a belief in some kind of higher power and doesn't just believe that uh, there's nothing at all, nothing spiritual, we're just here by mistake, nothing means anything. But nevertheless, that wasn't what Avram was trying to accomplish. In those days, everybody believed in some God. You know what I'm saying? Nobody believed like today, some people do, that it's just an accident and just things happen and one mistake and another mistake and five billion mistakes and here we are and that's it. Nobody believed anything that crazy. They did believe there was a higher power, but Avram was trying to explain how there was only one power and all of the other things that seemed to have separate powers were all part of one system. Yeah, because I believe that it's only fair or it's, it makes more sense for people like children who really don't have enough wisdom or enough information to, you know, to make them immediately punished when it's actually just a, a ignorance. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, he wouldn't punish them. He would certainly explain it to them. Okay. And just the same kind of connection when we are talking about a divorce. Is it any circumstances in a decision of the Jewish court? Let's see, the person doesn't want to do it because he feels that it would be more beneficial for his family, for his children. Maybe he had some not selfish reasons, but a really a, a Torah-given kindness and love that would stop him from give, man, about, to, give, to give the divorce to his wife. Right. So, of course, that is a, a good reason not to give a divorce, uh, but it, it will only be possible if she agrees to live with him as a family and raise the children together. If she insists that, that she cannot, based on valid reasons, based on whatever it might be, uh, the way he's treating her and whatever it is, then... And even though he would he would he would have liked to be able to raise the family together, but if it's not going to be possible, then then it's not going to happen anyway. It does okay. take two to tango, as they say. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yes. I heard uh, Rabbi Avram Tversky Olashon. He said that many people say that they're atheists, that they don't believe in God. He says the truth is they do believe in God. The problem is that they believe that they are God. <laughs> yeah. Like they're the, they're the last word on everything. Yep. Yes. To believe in atheism is requires a leap of faith, you know. Because an atheist believes that there is no God. And it's really impossible to prove that there is no God. Like you can say, I, I don't believe that there is necessarily a God. I mean, of course, I do believe it. But I'm saying a person can logically say, you know, maybe it's just a Big Bang and it's just evolution and blah, blah, blah. But to say that it's that he believes absolutely there is no God, well, how can you prove it? You, you cannot prove that. That's just a belief. It's a leap of faith that he's taking because he does not want to have to answer to any higher power. But it's really not a logical thing to say with certainty there is no God because you cannot prove that. Rabbi, unfortunately, the 
foxhole analogy doesn't work with atheists because they say if there was a God, then there wouldn't be a foxhole. <laughs> so, like, it jams up there. How do you answer that? Well, they could say it, but when they're in the foxhole, well, those yeah. same people are praying. <laughs> right, right, Despite yeah. all their protestations beforehand, right. when they're in the situation, they're praying. Afterwards, they can complain and say it's not fair. Why did there have to be? Ba 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 ba. But at the same time, they 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 still have that belief. They're complaining right. because they believe. So they're complaining to towards a power that they're upset with. So yeah, I don't have the answer for why there has to be foxholes and tragedies and wars, but but I'm just saying the belief is there even if they have complaints about it to to some degree or another. When okay. I, so when I was working, uh, there was a fellow that worked there, and he was very very is in the hospital. He was very very proud of the fact that he didn't believe in God. He was always pushing atheism. Mm -hmm. So one day he was working day shift in the hospital. He gets up at 5.30 in the morning uh, to work the shift and to be there at 7. So he comes to work and he looks at the schedule and there, he realizes that he's not working. That he should have been off that day, but he got up at 5 a.m. because he made a mistake in the schedule and he didn't realize it. So as soon as he realized that there was a mistake, he said, oh, God. I said, I said to him, what did you say? He says, oops, <laughs> oops. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so the Mishnah says, going along the same lines of um, sometimes getting a zetz and getting a patch can help the person wake up and realize that there's something deeper. Rabbi Yeshua, the son of Levi, said, Every day an echo resounds from Mount Sinai, proclaiming and saying, Woe is to the creatures who insult the Torah. For one who does not occupy himself in Torah is considered an outcast. As is stated, a golden nose ring in the snout of a swine, a beautiful woman bereft of reason. So basically, there is a voice that echoes from Mount Sinai every day, and it's basically a Musser voice. Somebody mentioned Musser earlier. It's a voice of Musser. Hashem is scolding those people who insult the Torah and do not follow it. Now, who is exactly hearing this scolding? I mean, we don't really hear voices from heaven. Most of us don't. But on some deep level, our souls can get a little bit of a, a shake from Hashem's voice that echoes out and gives them this scolding. Because really, everybody's soul, once again, deep down, has the right beliefs. And Hashem is shaking us up from, some, from time to time. Sometimes we hear it. Sometimes we don't hear it, but maybe we experience some kind of shakeup in our lives, some kind of trouble, some kind of issue. And that is really an echo of that voice of Hashem that is saying, hey, wake up. Something's got to change. And this brings us to the story in the Gemara. I will say this story in the Gemara is a difficult story to understand. Um, so I'm not claiming to give you a full explanation for it, but a partial explanation, at least uh, one that will give some understanding to the story, is what the Reb is going to say here. So the Talmud says an incident occurred in which Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, came from Migdal Gedor. Rabbi Lazar was, of course, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. He was the author of the Zohar. He was a great Torah scholar himself, a very high-level tzaddik, very righteous man. After he passed away, his body did not rot for many years. There's a whole story about that. But without getting into that, he was riding on a donkey and strolling on the bank of the river. He was very happy, and his head was swollen with pride because he had studied much Torah. 
So he was feeling a little bit, uh, a little bit puffed up. Again, he was a tzaddik, so his pride was not like my pride or your pride, but he still, he, he felt good about himself. He happened upon an exceedingly ugly person who said to him, greetings to you, my rabbi. Now we know if somebody greets you, it's absolutely mandatory to return that greeting, to respond to it. A person who does not respond when they're greeted is considered to be stealing. They're stealing the greeting. That person is owed a greeting. He greeted you. You owe him the greeting in return. It's only right. And not greeting in return is, is considered stealing. In fact, it is proper, according to the Gemara, to greet somebody first before they greet you. But at the very least, if they greet you, you must greet them back. But here, he ignored him. Instead, Abelazah said to him, worthless person, reka is the word in Aramaic. How ugly is the vessel you made? Sorry, I skipped the line. How ugly is that man? Are all of the people in your city as ugly as you? So he really gave it to him. The man said to him, I do not know, but you should go and say to the craftsman who made me, how ugly is the vessel you made? So what do you want from me, the man says to the rabbi. I'm ugly. I, I didn't make myself. Hashem made me. And if this is how Hashem made me, you have complaints against Hashem. You can't give credit or discredit to somebody for their beauty or for their ugliness. The beauty comes from Hashem and, and ugliness comes from Hashem. When Rabbi Loza realized that he had sinned and insulted this man merely on account of his appearance, he descended from his donkey and prostrated himself before him. He bowed to the ground and he said to the man, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. The man said to him, I will not forgive you until you go to the craftsman who made me, which is of course Hashem, and say, how ugly is the vessel you made? He walked behind the man trying to appease him until they reached our beloved city. The people of the city came out to greet him, saying to him, greetings to you, my rabbi, my rabbi, my master, my master. The man said to them, who are you calling my rabbi, my rabbi? They said to him, to this man who was walking behind you. He said to them, if this man is a rabbi, may there not be many like him among the Jewish people. They asked him, for what reason do you say this? He said to them, he did such and such to me. They said to him, even so forgive him, as he is a great Torah scholar. He said to them, for your sakes, I forgive him, provided that he accepts upon himself not to become accustomed to behave like this. Immediately, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elazar, sorry, the son of Rabbi Shimon, entered the study hall, that's the base medrash, and he taught. A person should always be soft like a reed and should not be stiff like a cedar. As one who is proud like a cedar is likely to sin. So the cedar is very tall and very big, but it can also get bent out of shape and crack and be done in a strong wind. The reed is very small compared to the cedar, but it's also supple and it bends over very easily. And that's why it does not break in the wind because it simply bends over. So that's humility. Person should be humble and not arrogant. And therefore due to its gentle qualities, the reed merited that a quill is taken from it to write with it a Torah scroll, tefillin and mezuzahs. Nowadays, the sofrim, the uh, ones who write uh, those scrolls use feathers, but it seems like in ancient times they would use reeds. They would use an actual reed that would um, you know, bring the edge of it to a sharp point and they would use that as a pen. So according to the Talmud, that is because the reed represents the quality of humility 
And that's why that is the material that, that was used to write these holy artifacts. Okay, so this is a very difficult story to understand. When we speak about rabbis in the Talmud, we imagine them to be people of extremely high spiritual stature, people who really, really had perfected their character. Whenever we speak of a tzaddik, we speak of a person who, who barely ever sins. I mean, we don't say that a tzaddik never sins. You know, even Moshe Rabbeinu, he made some mistakes here and there. But, but certainly no major sins. Any sin we always try to minimize and say, well, it's because of this, it's because of that, didn't really mean it, didn't really know, whatever it might be. But, but we really put them up on a very high pedestal. And here we have this rabbi. Okay, he was in a good mood. He was feeling good about himself. But how could he just, just tell this guy off, just such a put down, for no good reason? I mean, everybody knows that being ugly is not anybody's fault. I mean, that goes without saying. So, so what was this all about? This is a question. And if anybody has an answer or an explanation or a possible explanation, please. Rabbi, I don't have an explanation, but I have a question on that. Yes, please. I was told and understood that we are all created in God's image. Yes. So how or why would Hashem make someone or create someone ugly? That doesn't make sense to me. This is a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that question because it's one of the mysteries of creation. Like the same question can be said about, you know, Hashem, we understand Hashem to be a good, kind, loving God. So why does he make some babies with deformities, with illnesses, painful sicknesses, and so on? Um, it, it's not really a, a question I'm equipped to answer. This is one of the enigmas of creation. But I will say this, that very often behind the facade of ugliness, there's really a very beautiful inner core. And sometimes when you get to know the person better, uh, you might be able to look past the, you know, the superficial level and see the inner beauty. Well, with that, you're right, because I have seen lots of Down syndrome children that have a beautiful life, and yet they are also have a beautiful inner soul. Yes. And the same thing, it does not have to be with Down syndrome. It could be anyone, like you say, a deformed child. Why would Hashem uh, make or create a deformed child? But that child, I guess, over the years, depending on what their child may end up doing, is really a beautiful soul. Yes. And it's true. I have and I have seen a young lady of roughly 13 years of age with no arms at all. Wow. Yes. And, of course, she eats with her feet, you know, the utensils and all that, does whatever she has to do. And yet, when she's painting, she's using her feet and her pictures. I mean, her pictures are beautiful. Yes. They should, they should be in the Louvre or the Louvre in France. That's how beautiful those pictures are. I have they seen have, some um, pictures, actually. Growing up in my parents' home, they should be, well, we have a, a painting there of somebody who painted with their feet for that same reason. I mean, you see how beautiful
those pictures are. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Yes. Why would Hashem do this? Still don't have an answer, but perhaps it does help us. It's a good question. It is a good question. I'm not presuming to give a definitive answer, but perhaps it does help us see the inner beauty and, and come to learn about the inner core of the person, learn how to overlook things. You know, I just saw a picture on Facebook. I think he's yeah. frozen. Who? Me? Oops, I, no, the rabbi. I think he's frozen. Oh. Rabbi. Because yeah, I don't have a picture of the Hello. rabbi in front of me, David. Yeah, his, uh, mm -hmm. his. Yeah, now we can. You froze for a minute or two. Okay, so here me, is rabbi? the. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What I was saying on Facebook this morning, in fact, there was a picture of a young lady. I don't know how old, but a young lady. And she had a medical condition, and you can see it in her face. She must have a 10 to 15 pound tumor wow. right on the right side. But yet, she's still a beautiful young lady. Wow. Shem should help her. I'm sure Hashem will. Amen. So I'm just going to give the Rebbe's explanation to this story. And, and this is going to circle back to what we started with. The possible explanation is that Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, saw that this man was not just physically ugly, but he was spiritually ugly. This was a person who had very negative qualities, very poor ethics, very bad character. And his physical appearance was actually mirroring his inner ugly spiritual appearance. You know, sometimes a person can be beautiful on the outside and really can be a, a difficult, cruel person on the inside. Sometimes, on the contrary, somebody can be very ugly on the outside but can be a beautiful person on the inside. But sometimes the inside and the outside are actually mirroring each other. A person can be beautiful and that can be an expression of their inner beauty. And a person can be physically ugly and that can be expressing their spiritual ugliness. And Rabbi Lazar saw that this person was spiritually ugly. Now, why did he have to insult him just because he's spiritually ugly? The point is he was trying to get a reaction out of him. He was trying to bring him to realize that he had to fix something. Just like we learned before that Avraham would give his guests a zetz and he would say, hey, if you don't believe, you got to pay. And that would shake them up and make them rethink their beliefs and think, hey, I'm stuck here in the middle of nowhere. If I don't pay, maybe I'm going to be thrown into debtor's prison or who knows what. Maybe, maybe really I should start praying. So, so it was the zets that he was trying to give to this person saying, hey, why are you so ugly? What's with you? And the man's response when he said, go to the craftsman that made me was exactly, was exactly, excuse me, what Rabbi Lazar wanted to hear. Because when the man said, go to the craftsman that made me, he was expressing his belief in Hashem his belief that nothing in this world is in vain and that he too is here for a reason and Hashem made him and certainly he has to fulfill his role in creation and so on. So again, this, does, this still doesn't answer all the details of the story. He walked behind him and he didn't forgive until Arbelazar bowed and the people asked. So it doesn't, I'm not explaining all the details of the story, but the general idea is that he was trying to shake him up and make him recognize that he, he had to do something about his ugliness, spiritual ugliness, and the man recognizing that everything from Hashem was the beginning of his coming to be aware of that. So I hope I uh, explained this uh, clearly.
but it's the same idea just to give you a, a 30 second roundup David. I know you always want a 30 second roundup. So the roundup is that Avram would force the people to say that they believed in Hashem. But when they said it, even though he was forcing them, really, it was what they really believed. Because deep down, humanity has a belief in Hashem. And sometimes it takes a stressful situation for that belief to come to the surface. So if the people came to that realization on their own after being explained nicely, so be it. But if Avram had to give them the zets, the financial zets that they needed to come to that belief, then he would do that. But when they would say it, it had some meaning to it because that was really their deep down belief. All right. A uh, quick question, uh, Rabbi. It's, yes. Uh, I guess mainly hearsay. I've not seen the, seen the written word, but there's been criticism of Abraham because while he worked so hard to bring people to accept monotheism, that at the end of the day, uh, there weren't all that many people who uh, he influenced on a long-term basis. Well, he, he got the project started, and then Yitzchak continued, and then Yaakov, and then his children, and here we are today. It's a work in progress. He did his yeah, part to, to get the ball rolling. Now we right. have to continue his work. Thank you. Yashkaya. Very good. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi, Everybody, Rabbi, I think this well, class is going to be on Tuesday. While we're still here, Rabbi, you want to try to squeeze in this story in about a, a couple minutes? The story of the Rebbe Rashab and his brother. Okay, so the Rebbe Rashab was a young Rebbe. He had just, uh, his father had passed away recently. His brother and him were like co-Rebbes at that time. Somebody came to him and asked him for a bracha, for something he needed, he really needed major help for. And the Rebbe said, no, I can't help you. There's no way I can help you. And when the man, and, and this was a really huge issue. We don't know what it was exactly, but it was a huge issue. And when the man heard that from the Rebbe, he was so broken that he came out of the Rebbe's office and he was crying and crying uncontrollably. So the Rebbe Rashab had an older brother who was named the Rebbe Zalman Aaron. At that point, it wasn't clear who would be the Rebbe and who would be the Rebbe's brother. They were kind of sharing it. And his brother came to him and he said, is this how you treat a chassid? You, you say, no, you can't help him. You make him so upset. He's crying. The Rebbe Shev said, really, he's crying? Give me my gartel. And he put on his gartel and he told his gabai to send in the man again to the yechidas, to the, to the private audience. And the Rebbe Shev gave him a bracha that he should be saved from whatever it was. And so it was. So what is the point of this story? Like, if the Rebbe Rashab said he couldn't help him, it's probably because he couldn't help him. So what exactly changed just because he was crying? And once again, the idea is that at that point, before he was crying, he was actually beyond help. For whatever reason, he did not deserve that miraculous salvation that he needed. But when he broke down, and he really humbled himself in front of Hashem, and he cried out to Hashem from the depths of his heart, that actually changed his destiny, and the Rebbe Hashem could sense that. When he heard how he was crying, the Rebbe Hashem realized that he reached a core level of himself, a very deep level, that came out to plead to Hashem from that level, and in that merit in and of itself, the Rebbe Hashem realized that he deserved to be blessed, and he did. So that's why the Rebbe was a little bit harsh with him. Maybe the Rebbe was trying to elicit that response. And when he got it, he was able to give him that bracha. Very good. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.